So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit of where I come from. Most of you know that already. And the ideas behind hydroponics, how it works, where it comes from, and then what I'm working on. So, where I come from is a land called South Africa, where we have a lot of space, a lot more than Singapore, and this is the Namakwa land uh, flowers in the Western Cape, and when you talk about farming or growing anything, you, talk, you usually think about something like this. And what ends up happening here is that you get a lot of water wasted, as you can see, and it's not really sufficient, uh, it, or rather what I would say is efficient, because when you do distributed um, farming, what happens is a lot of the crop doesn't end up in the shops. Anything with slight blemishes or anything that's just not, just short of perfect doesn't go to retail simply because nobody would buy it. So one of the things that people are thinking of is growing it yourself and therefore in South Africa a lot of people use gardens. Now I'm used to a garden like this. <laughs> Something like this in Singapore would obviously cost you a lot more um, than an HDB flat. So for the past five years since I've been here my biggest frustration was that I couldn't work in the garden the way I used to. I'm gonna carry on talking. Yeah, okay. Okay, sure, sure, sure. There. You can see that side, great. Okay. Yes, okay. So just a little bit of history about how vertical farming and how hydroponics works and where it comes from. This it was conceptualized in 1999 uh, by Prof. Pomier. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. Um, and over the past five years there's been multiple different types of solutions that came up for different types of plants. And what happens is you end up saving a lot of space, you end up saving a lot of water, simply because you're not uh, watering the entire earth just to get to the roots of a single tree, you're only focusing on those roots. Uh, so the claim is, and uh, it's a number that's being thrown around, that you're saving 90% of water, but well, I'm not really so sure about that. Uh, but it's still in the early stages and there's a lot of space for automation. Uh, so I think definitely it was, if we're talking about hackware, this is something that's really suitable for a lot of people, uh, especially in Singapore. The sustainability issues mostly revolves around uh, growing crops that, um, what do you call it in English? Sorry, English is not my first language. Uh, staple food. Staple food cannot be grown using hydroponics, yet when you're talking about rice, wheat, maize, those types of stuff is usually used um, over large swaths of land. Uh, so it's mostly focused on leafy greens at the moment, but again in Singapore that's a really good thing because salad here is really expensive. <laughs> no, truly. And then <clears throat> the other issue with regards to farming is that you get less and less people being involved in growing our own food. It used to be that when last have you eaten anything that you yourself killed? Now, these days, it's when last have you eaten anything that you yourself grown. So it's becoming more and more concentrated, and it's really a problem. So the idea behind vertical farming is that when you distribute it again, instead of centralizing it, what you end up happening is that you take away the factor of transport. Because most of the food, especially in Singapore, when you're talking about 95% of our food definitely gets imported into Singapore, and of that you're talking about 7,000 tons of food gets wasted every year. So the thing is, if you grow things yourself, you have more pride in it. Means you'll most likely eat everything that you make. But not just that, you'll also only harvest what you're going to eat. You won't overgrow, you won't overharvest. And the whole point is to bring the point of production as close as possible to the point of consumption. So, the different methods, oh, let, let me just show you how it works quickly, it's very simple actually. You start with the germination of the seeds and you transfer it to, uh, you grow your seedlings 
and you transplant it to your growth medium, you use these little baskets um, to allow the water to pass over the roots and you stack them up in pipes that lets the water flow past the roots and you feed them light and nutrients and then you harvest. That's a cycle. It's really as simple as that. How I only came across this in the 1990s, I don't know, but it's pretty awesome. So the one, there's about six units, six ways of doing it. The one way of doing it is create a system whereby you have wicks hanging in the water and it simply draws the nutrients up to the roots. This usually would use some soil uh, where the grounds can uh, firmly hold themselves. And usually you will have an air pump with an air stone. The reason for that is to reoxygenate the water. Plants need nutrients, carbon and oxygen. The other thing is sometimes with a floating platform. This you will mostly see uh, near the sea but not for growing plants, usually they will grow uh, seaweeds and things like that. <coughs> but it's the same premise, it's just a different setup where you actually float the platform inside the water as opposed to bringing the water up with the wick. After that, you'll see there's a different setup where the reservoir actually floats, uh, pumps the water up and then it floods the entire system. The GIF is not working at the moment, but you'll see that basically what happens here is when the water flows up, you'll have another pipe here where when the overflow comes back down, it just flows back and circulates in the system. Then again with soil, you have the dripping solution. Same premise, you pump the water up, you let it flow down, and you provide the necessary oxygen. And one of the more recent popular ones, especially for small units, desktop units, uh, misting solution where you have a nozzle that just sprays the water onto the roots as they hang. And the most popular one for large scale hydroponic solutions is the new, is what, it's called the nutrient film method. It just creates a thin film of water that passes the roots and it cycles back into the water. And this is also the method that I've been using. But you can see there's huge amounts of um, companies, especially in the US, it's very popular at the moment, and in Japan. Um, we're hoping that it comes to Singapore pretty soon. There's about seven vertical farms in Singapore. Two of them are used for educational purposes. One is for social um, purposes, and the rest are all fish vertical farms. So we don't really have this type of setup at a large scale in Singapore yet. You also see on uh, this, there's two types, right? There's vertical farming on the horizontal plane, and then there's vertical farming on the vertical plane. This one is a bit different from the other ones. It's also a dripping solution. We have the gutter, and the nutrient solution drips into the top and just flows past the root down, and then they catch it back in the reservoirs and pump it back up. So this is my solution. What I've done here is I've really struggled to figure out how I'm going to fit everything into one small space because I'm just getting my own space now and I'm not allowed to turn a place into a jungle <laughs> as such. <laughs> so I've, over the past few months I've been shopping around and seeing and looking into what format to use and the way I've done it was actually the wrong way of doing it because what you should be doing is you should be figuring out what you're going to grow first and then you figure out what you're going to build in order to house those. So what ended up happening is I ended up with a little bit of a Frankenstein. Uh, so at the bottom here you'll see the NFT, the nutrient film method, and at the top there you'll see the flood and drain. Uh, this one add, got added on later on as you can see. I ended up using one of our old bookcases to convert this. Uh, so what's going to happen here is you're going to have a tank at the bottom, which will be around 40 liters of water, which carries the nutrient solution as well. And then the water has to pump up all the way to here, which is about 1.85 meters up. And within that gutter, it will then flow down into these buckets, which has a bit of a play there. The reason for this is because when you grow plants that um, specifically needs to flower and um, create fruit, 
you need a lot more nutrients and a lot more water than you would in a traditional one. And you also need to hold that plant more steady. So at the top here, I'm going to have chilies and tomatoes. And at the bottom here, which is the ones that's more suitable for leafy greens, a whole range of salads and herbs, including sage and uh, rosemary is not needed, and basil and all those. Yes, Roland? Are you using the same uh, nutrient mix of both species, or both sets of species? Or is that the same what? Same nutrient mix? Or same yes. Nutrient? Yes. Uh, the nutrient mix is pretty standard. Uh, it's in terms of how you differentiate between them is in terms of the amount and the type of lighting you give it. Yeah, so yeah, let's talk about the lighting. Lighting, you're looking at three color spectrums. It's obviously blue, red, and green, but the very specific ones that's uh, ideal for photosynthesis is blue and red. Blue specifically around 448 wavelengths, and red specifically around 624. So those three, those two, that's why you'll see that most of the large-scale commercial solutions, it looks purple, because they use a combination between red and blue lights. The combination for lights that you use for to create a bigger plant to promote growth is a combination of one blue LED for every five red LEDs. But if you want to promote growth of fruit, you have to have more red. So you, you would, usually would then go and take one blue LED with every nine red LEDs. Uh, it's, it's very much of an experiment you have to, every time you want to install a solution, you have to experiment with yourself and see what's optimum for the type of crop you want to grow. So, here, um, when you talk about lights, obviously, to answer Roland's question as well, the solution that I've come up with in order to make sure that these guys have more lights than these guys, because they wouldn't need more, is to just have a wooden frame added on top so that I can add more lights. I've had a lot of problems with this thing, and one of the lessons that I've learned is don't skimp on the tools, especially when it comes to drill bits, because they break, and if you're going to spend a third of the amount for a drill bit that's going to keep breaking, you're going to end up spending more than you would have by just getting the proper, good, branded one. And PVC piping is a lot harder than you actually think it is. <laughs> so. I have one problem here that I would like to see if anyone here can help me with. I've got a couple of solutions that, I'm, that I was thinking of. I've got two pumps. One is from an aquarium which, for which the flow rate for this system is correct. It flows at around 8 liters per minute. But it's not strong enough to get all the way up there. And the other one I have is strong enough to get all the way up to double but the flow rate is 50 liters per minute. And that means I'm going to flood my place, so I can't use it. So the solution I've come up with is either I use a reservoir at the top where I flood that reservoir and let gravity do the work, but I only switch the pump on intermediately, or I use um, a lighter pump, and I'm, I found one for 30 liters per minute, and then I use uh, T-junctions to divert the flow, part of the flow back into the tank and the rest upwards.